Hello and welcome to another edition of Canadian's Time. A lot of ground to cover today as there's been a lot of subjects plopping around in the Canadian's universe. Recently, the Canadians picked up a surprising victory over the Tampa Bay Lightning. And of course, you can read the recaps and, you know, watch the highlights if you want to get a a view of how that game went. I'm not going to recap the games because there's plenty of people who do that fine and you'll get a better job of that from somebody else. So I'm just going to jump into, you know, obviously though, the upshot of that game though was that we had Kirby doc back. We had Brendan Gallagher back, but Josh Anderson got injured and we don't know for how long he, he's not on the trip to Boston. So victory but he has got to wonder what are we doing here so first subject to talk about tonight is prospects um as uh ryan prott pointed out in an article that he wrote uh there are five canadians prospects in the ncaa tournament lane hudson luke tuck rhett pitlick jacob dobosh and sean farrell some of them are going to be facing off against each other, so they will not be in the NCAA tournament for very long as uh, Farrell and Dobosh face off against each other in their opening round game. Um, I'm not sure where Pitlick is, so I'm not sure where he will end up um, playing um, Hudson and Tuck have to take on Western Michigan first. So I'm not sure if their paths will cross with Pitlick anytime soon. Speaking of Hudson, um, Scott Matla on Lockdown Canadians ran down a few of his um, accomplishments in the Hockey East tournament. He scored two goals in the Hockey East championship, including the game-winning goal in overtime. He's beat Brian Leach's under-19 scoring record. In Matla's opinion, his defensive and positioning work, had, there's work to be done there. Um, Hattie Kalakach, who's an excellent prospects expert, um, has, has had this to say about him, quote, he has so much left to develop. His defensive game is behind the curve. His pivots are still somewhat of an issue, and he's just beginning to come out of his shell and try new things. But two aspects of his game have grown over the past year. And Cal Ketch in his article, which I'll leave in the show notes, goes deeper into that. I'm not going to read an entire article to you on this podcast. That would be just swiping somebody else's work, and also that would be pretty boring to listen to. So I urge you to go read the article to find out more about that. But uh, Kalakesh also talked about Jane Strubel, who recently signed with the the, the organization is now going to be with the Rocket. And he had um, he had a had a detailed analysis of Strubel. He um, he his analysis included that he says he doesn't shoot very often, has trouble switching assignments in the defensive zone, and can get too eager to throw his weight around when defending the rush, leaving gaps in coverage. But he also says, and this is a quote continued, there are elements of his game that point in the direction of a player with a high offensive ceiling. Elements that, if refined, could make him a tra top transition defenseman in the NHL. And this... Um, dovetails with the tweet thread that Kalakish had last week talking about the Struble's upsides offensively. So um, that just one of the same, there's, there's a, there's a, just an offensive uh, flair he may have and it can develop. Then uh, on the subject of Sean Farrell, uh, Kalakesh says that in his in, in terms of his abilities, Farrell looks looks the part of a top NHL playmaker, and he goes into the various weapons that Farrell has, 
And he also says his skating and board play have improved. So that's just, and there's, there's great detail in the article to look at. And, um, and uh, Marco D'Amico um, also talked about in an article of his own, talked about the, where Farrell might end up contractually after the NCAA season ends. And he noted that because of Farrell's age and birthday, he can sign a three-year entry-level contract rather than the two-year deals that Jordan Harris and Struble sign, who because of their ages, they could only sign a two-year deal. So if Farrell could then join the Canadians and he'd still burn a year, but he wouldn't be burning one year of the two-year deal, he'd have a three-year deal. So that was very helpful information from Marco D'Amico. Other prospects, um, D'Amico in an, another article spoke about um, several other prospects like Joshua Waugh, who has 90 points in 52 games as of the article's publication, which was fourth in his league in points per game. Riley Kidney is fifth in the QMJHL in scoring. He hit the 100-point mark. And Adam Ingstrom is doing well, as is Owen Beck and Rhett Pitlick. And there's more details. I will put that article in the show notes. Um, once again, not going to read an entire article to you. Urge you to go take a look. And then uh, D'Amico also had a, a very interesting uh, idea in that um, there's an unsigned goalie. Uh, out of Quinnipiac, uh, Yanni Peretz, who has been ex extremely good in his career. This season, he has a 0.929 save percentage and a 1.52 goals against average. And um, D'Amico said, why not have the Canadians try and go get him when the uh, when his season comes to an end? And that would be a, quite an interesting, you know, quite an interesting option as a pickup. He somehow just didn't end up with a deal, um, and and uh, you know, sort of like a an Arbor Jack guy of goaltenders, um, and uh, and it. It certainly would be an interesting idea, but given the Canadians are a bit shaky in the goaltending uh, area, as once you get down into the prospects area, and Peretz has been just um, just a really, really excellent goaltender um, in his two seasons. So that was a very interesting uh, idea posed there. So we'll see. Um, Quinnipiac could have their season end as soon as this weekend. So, um, so that's just an interesting possibility. Turning to the forwards. So Kirby Doc came back for the Lightning game, and Matt Drake wrote a piece that sung his praises. And uh, one of the points he made was that Doc in addition to the goal he scored, he said that Doc was seen on multiple occasions taking the puck into the corner and holding it there against an onslaught of lightning forwards trying to dig it out and get their last-ditch effort going. So he was noting the sort of the tough play that Doc was putting in there and uh, sort of stymieing the lightning, and um, that was good to see. I just thought, I just thought it notable that we – that it's it's you know we we know what Kirby Doc can do offensively. He's excellent offensively, and there have been questions about um, some of his other skills, like can he can he um, win faceoffs? And um, I think there were some questions about um, his physicality, even. And it certainly seems like he's gotten into fights. He seems to be going into the board strongly. And so this just seems to be another branch of that where he seems to be contributing um, when, even when he's not, you know, scoring on, on the net. And um, interesting topic of Dennis Gurionov. Uh, Scott Matlow was uh, 
singing his praises on Lockdown Canadians. He spoke of him as a possible trigger man to Uri Savkovsky. He described him as a power play weapon. He can shoot. And he, at the moment, he has five goals in 11 games. Um, interestingly, though, um, then there was the question, though, of would they sign him? His qualifying offer would be $2.9 million at the end of the year. And um, the Habs Unfiltered crew discussed it. And uh, Treg Wilson said he'd like to sign him, but he doesn't want to sign him for four or five million or for three million. And he, while while saying that he has a hell of a shot, he passes well. He's a good skater, and he has size. You know, the, quoting Wilson there, um, and uh, and Blaine Potvin noted that they don't have to sign him at that 2.9 million they could do what they did with rem pitlick and not offer the qualifying offer and then go back and resign him later but of course um they discussed on the show that Gurianov's production is above what pitlick's is so Gurianov may not accept that but um but it was just an interesting discussion they had because of the question of the logistical and the practical idea of, well, you want to keep Gurion off, but can you keep him and at what cost? So um, I think I think the Canadians should try to keep him. He's young. He's um, certainly showing his value. Um, so if they can try to keep him and find a way to keep that contract reasonable, um, I, I'd say do it. Um, I, I, I would even say me personally, I'd say even do it at the qualifying offer. And maybe that's, maybe that's a ridiculous position to take, but I think, um, it, it it's just, it's not the worst contract in the world compared to some of the contracts they're saddled with. Like after, you know, you got the, like the Mike Hoffman contracts and stuff like that. So so I, I just, um, I think maybe you just try to sign him and see where it goes. Um, speaking of Jesse Ullinen, um, Scott Matla is, was also big high on him on Lockdown Canadians. Called him a big shooter, finding confidence, and sees him as a twenty goal guy in the middle six. And uh, that's uh, it. You know, it, it is interesting because it wasn't always obvious that that would be the case. Um, it, it's a very tricky thing to see where Ulan would fit in. Um, and uh, and I think that he's reaching that point and um, everything. I'm going to take everything Matla says is pretty much, you know, excellent analysis so um, I look forward to that, see just, you know, how far Ulanen can go. And um, and I I think that would be excellent. Um, now, in the more controversial of forwards, you have Jonathan Drouin. And this is um, – this is this is a tricky one. Now, the Habs and Filter crew, um, Blaine Potvin and Matt Smith, both think the Canadians are going to move on from him. Uh, Brian Wild, on the other hand, in a recent article, pointed out that Duran has been the leading scorer from the club since the All Star break, and he wonders does that not merit a contract offer of some sort and uh he thinks that that should merit a, a contract offer at least for a year and um he believes that's been earned so it's and i i i see the logic in it i mean the 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 other side to it is and it's been expressed is that Duran was brought in with expectations that were way too high. So the fan base was set up to 
um, be disappointed no matter what. So even now when Joran is doing uh, this, this um, point per game pace, though many, most of them are assists, but still point per game pace, it's still a question of, is he worth it? And I, but I, I, I take Wild's point. I mean, he's been very productive and I'm not sure that it wouldn't make sense to do like one year at some reasonable contract length if he would do it. Um, and, um, but I also see the other side where it just, you, you just say, this is enough is enough and, um, and you let it go. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm really fine with it either way. And um, speaking of though, speaking of though, keeping or letting people go, um, Matt Smith on Habs Unfiltered said uh, that Michael Bozetta has done the things necessary to secure a spot on the team for next season, in his opinion. Uh, I would tend to agree with somebody who knows a lot more about hockey than I do. So that's easy for me to do. But um, I think, I think Pizzetta is just, um, he seemed in, there seemed to be a point where he was struggling, but he has been, he's a very effective fourth liner with him on the fourth line, with the players they put on the fourth line with him, they seem to play better. He he has the physicality that is still needed in the game. Um, so he's just he has he has energy when when oftentimes sometimes the rest of the team doesn't have energy, he still has energy. Um, he's he gets he gets he gets like a gritty goal when when the players that should be scoring goals aren't scoring goals he's just it's just it's hard to explain his game but it's it's just it's just uh it's effective and i think since the you know ken hughes is saying you know it's still going to be two or three years i think then let him be a part of the of this process right now until you don't have a space for him. Um, now, speaking of the process, though, um, Marco D'Amico pointed out in an article that, um, and this was while Kirby Doc was out, he said, Quote, we currently live in a time when the Canadians will ice a center line of Nick Suzuki, Alex Belzeal, Chris Tierney, and Anthony Richard. This is due to a string of injuries to Kirby Doc, Sean Monaghan, Christian Dvorak, and Jake Evans out with injuries. And the premise of the article, which I urge you to read, you know, goes into the details about the lack of center depth in the entire organizational structure and how vulnerable the Canadians are given that lack of depth. And he notes that um, Owen Beck and Riley Kidney are not NHL ready yet. So that means that there's just, there's this still not, they're not people ready to come up and fill those voids. Now, ideally, you wouldn't have four of your centers out with injuries. Um, and, of course, Doc is back, so that does mitigate the issue a bit, um, but only a bit. Um, but it it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a concern. I mean, especially when going into the, the draft – this year that it was known that the Canadians needed a center and they got one in doc, but it was still known that, you know, that position was needed. And of course 
if anything happened to Doc, you still had a problem and something did happen to Doc. And so now they're there just have to be like, well, thank you know, you have to say, well, okay, hopefully something doesn't happen to Doc, Monahan, Dvorak, and Evans. Well, something did happen to Doc, Monahan, Dvorak, and Evans. And um and so, I mean, in one case, I mean, the amount of injuries the team has sustained, and I'll get into this in a little bit, you know, it's ridiculous, but it's also, um, it's it's also a question of who, you know, is there, is there the depth that they need? So I'm going to talk about the defense in a minute, but first word from our sponsor, McCraskets Baskets. If you need a basket, McCraskets Baskets have been making baskets since, since I don't even know since how long they've been making it. These are high quality baskets that won't let you down. They're not like the cheap baskets that will just crack on you when you're walking down the street with your tomatoes. And next thing you know, you got tomatoes all over the street and you got a broken basket and broken dreams. So give McCraskis Baskets a call or email or whatever you, you use to communicate today. You get yourself a sturdy basket that won't let you down. Okay. So the defense. Mark Dumont did a really solid piece, which I will urge you to read, like all the pieces I reference. He looked at expected goals for and expected goals against for the defenders. And he got into detail, and the detail will not be reproduced here. You can go take a look at the detail he uses. But when he one result he found was that Jordan Harris and Jonathan Kovacevic were among the most effective defenders by that measure. He then also looked at production of of points per 60 and found that Justin Barron was the most productive and it it has the ratings for all the defenders. So you can see how they all stack up, but that was, um, that was just good to see because, you know, it's been, you know, we, we kind of had the feeling that Harris and Kovacevic have been really solid and you get some numbers to back it up. But um, obviously it doesn't, you know, the, the the context is important because it's who are they going up against? Because obviously the first pair goes up against the top lines. And so there's always going to be that consideration so that it can't be taken entirely in a vacuum. Um, but needless to say, there there is there is some um uh, you can still draw from those results as as a, a positive. And uh, Ryan Pratt did a whole piece on Kovacevic, which was great. Um, and he spoke about, um, and he actually spoke about Harris and Kovacevic together and mentioned that they're, expected goals 4% percentage um, was a, a certain number. And then when the, neither of them are on the ice, it drops about 10%. So the, um, so in Pratt's words, the Canadians are better when these two are playing. And then Pratt warns though, again, context wise that, the first pair would might be playing the, you know, the top defense, the top offenses. And so might have a, a different expected goals ratio just because of that. So that may make it harder, but that there's still value to the measurement. And, um, but, you know, it just, the piece went into just overall, you know, what the value of Kovacevic was, to the team and how steady he's been. And then, you know, the, and this, and that stat along with Harris um, just sort of bolsters the, the idea that those two have been really, really solid 
um, defensively for the for the Canadians this year, and they really needed that. Of course, Harris is out right now, which is not great. Um, but hopefully, he'll be back soon. And uh, another player of great importance to the defense, Mike Matheson, was uh, profiled by Melissa Boyd, and um, she noted that during his first 36 games in Montreal, during that span, he put up seven goals and 23 points. That's a sport, scoring point, scoring pace of more than 50 points over a full 82 game schedule, and that's a that's a full quote there. Um, so. And and that that was noted that would be more than he put up last year as a, his career high in Pittsburgh. Um, so he you know he got injured and um, and that uh, that sort of derailed things. But um, but so he's still putting up great numbers, and uh, that piece I also urge you to look at. You know, get the whole story there. Um, I think he's really when since he's come back, he's been just just fantastic with you know offensively and defensively. I mean, and offensively, he's just his skating is just. I mean, it just. I mean, he's just been excellent, and um, and uh, and uh, as uh, Boyd says, um, she has has many many things to say about him but one one of the quotes is his skating ability creates scoring opportunities and allows him to correct mistakes in the defensive end so that's just another um just another point about how just well he skates um from somebody much better than me at, at analyzing players and that's it for the defense goalies last week we talked about carter hart and it came up on habs unfiltered a previous episode whether carter hart would be a good pickup for the canadians and um treg wilson bluntly called him the most overrated goalie in the NHL and uh Blaine Potvin noted his statistics which were good but also noted that Montembeau's statistics are equal to Carter Hart statistics and Montembeau is cheaper so if if I if I heard that right I, I believe I heard that right um, so that does sort of raise the question of well, why would you get Carter Hart if you have Montembeau, who gives you the same um, results for a lower price? So that was the that was the takeaway I got from that discussion, and um, I of course said that um, I was not sure about whether Carter Hart could be seen as proven. Um, just given some of his unpredictability, which he'd gone through in earlier seasons, um, these these points that the gentleman made on Habs Unfiltered are, are probably probably uh, surpass any concerns I might have if um, if they think that uh, he's not he's not going to be worth the money, then uh, then that's that's good enough for me. Also, speaking of the speaking of the rocket, which I wasn't really speaking of, I'm just transitioning. Uh, Scott Matlon, and Lockdown Canadians spoke about um, them getting reinforcements, which included Jaden Struble, who's been spoken of, and Emil Heineman. And Matla spoke about how, very importantly, um, in his eyes, Heineman's specific skill set is exactly what the rocket are missing. And he said that Heineman has a is a true scoring threat, shooting threat, I'm sorry, on the power play and offensively. And that the Rocket have been lacking finish, and Heineman has finish. So that's um that'll be interesting to see how Heineman contributes to the Rocket, who have been depleted by all their players being sent off to the Canadians. And now they get Heineman in 
to um, help out. And it'll be interesting to see what um, how Heinemann meets um, Atlas expectations. So it's going to talk about some more stuff in a minute, but now another word from one of our sponsors. Have you ever had ice cream hit with a hammer? Well, you should, because a hammer cream, it's the best tasting ice cream you'll ever have because it's frozen, then it's hit with a hammer and hit with a hammer again. And that gets the flavor just knocked around. And then once that's done, it's thawed out and put on a cone for you. You might say, what's the point? Well, the point is the hammer. That's the point. Hammer cream. You'll believe it when you taste it. All right. So the rebuild. So Kent Hughes was blunt in a recent press availability about he said he saw that it was to be two to three years before the team was where he was expecting it to be, as I as I heard it. Um, and uh, there were some certain opinions um, from various pundits. Um, for one thing, uh, the uh, Abs Unfiltered crew um, had some positive things to say in general about what the Canadians were doing, like Blaine Potvin's opinion of it was you know, the, the team isn't going to get rid of all the good players and force things. They are organically letting the team finish where the they finish while getting rid of the contracts they want to as they can. Um, and uh, and Trey Wilson augmented that by saying that in two to three years, a lot of the Berger Van Air contracts will be gone and can be replaced. And uh, they had a guest on, Matt Bedard, who uh, who basically was saying the young talent is going to grow together and is likely going to be playing together for the next six or seven years. Um, and uh, and and another another thing that um, was uh, and Brian Wild um, said separately in his own piece that. Um, the that the it was clear management had totally like moved away from the Bergevin era make the playoffs and see what happens strategy and um he called that strategy an illogical prayer and this and as he says quote this rebuild is going to have some pain in it but when it's done it is clear that the new management's goal is a Stanley Cup. So, so it Wild was optimistic about the strategy that was that was being employed, and um, uh, and another point that was brought up about it was um, they were talking on Habs Unfiltered about the the draft and the draft positioning and uh Treg Wilson um said that that the team doesn't need Bedard um and what he meant was that if the team the team does not the team if the team can only succeed if they get the number 1 pick in Connor Bedard, this generational talent, then the management's really bad because the, the management should be able to work with another top talent. They might get it the fifth spot or something like that. And, or, or, um, or any, he, he said A, B, and C. So he was using like the first three picks or something like that. But he's, his basic point was that, that, the, a good management team should be able to work with a top draft pick, even if it's not one of the top three. And um, he mentioned that some people don't don't necessarily sort of like that opinion, but I mean it's very very logical and um, and uh, and it's a, it's a dose of reality that you know the, the Canadians might not get in the top three, they might not get a good like a quote unquote 
you know, good draft selection um, uh, or, or they might not get one of the better um, slots in the, the lower part of the draft. And but that management still has to make it work and make it work under the circumstances. And if they needed to get that one guy, then that's a problem. And I, I think that makes all the sense, all the sense in the world. And um, I, I think people got to, you know, the people, the people who the, 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 the tankers who believe that, that Montreal needs to lose all their games and get down to number, you know, let be number 32 in the league. Um, that's, that's not necessary for the, for the rebel to work. Speaking of the tank, though, Scott Matla wrote a piece. Um, just he um, he does an update on how the tank is going, or and um, and and as of as of the Lightning game, he said that thanks to a Flyers win over the Panthers, the Canadians will remain with the fifth best odds at the first overall pick. Um, a nice note to the night after a Habs win. Now, tonight, uh, Arizona's playing. I know that. So that's going to possibly affect things. Um, obviously, this is only as good as the day it's practically written. So things are going to keep changing. But um, at the time I'm recording this, um, Columbus has 51 points, San Jose 53, Chicago 54, Anaheim 56, Montreal 62, Philadelphia 64, Arizona 65. So that's that's sort of the the where the landscape is in these in these uh, lower rungs. You know, it's it's it, it's going to be tricky for Montreal to fall very far. Um, and uh, but it'll also be tricky to see um, just who, how these teams play in the last part of the season. Um, I'll certainly be interested to see how the final results turn out because um, some of the teams are I mean, some of these te- the, not all its teams are not necessarily losing their games. I mean, it's not it's not it it could it could get interesting. Finally. Um, injuries uh, on the on the one side of things, um, as Treg Wilson pointed out and Habs unfiltered, if the Canadians had been healthy all year, in his opinion, they would have been in the top fifteen, probably not making the playoffs, but would have been in the hunt like Florida is now. And I take his view to be correct. Um, I have no reason to believe otherwise. And I mean, certainly given how many Canadians players have been injured and how well they play when they play well, given how many players are not available, I have to believe they'd actually be somewhat of a credible team had they not had those injuries um and and uh so it's uh it's very unfortunate and on the happy hour they talked about this and david Auger pointed out the habs are the most injured injured team in the league and it's an outlier it's not even it's 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 out there um and they, um, the the trio actually found a, a site called uh, Man Games Lost. Um, it's a Twitter account that actually looks this stuff up, um, and to, to check the the check the data out, and uh, that was good. And um, and uh, OJ. Um, has been very frustrated with people and the medical side because as he put it, like we'll never know certain things, but 
people are going to look for splinters of truth in bullshit. And I know what he's saying. And there's, you know, some people are criticizing the medical staff now. And it's a it's a question. I mean, I don't know if there's some stuff that the the staff could be doing differently, whether it's it's just just like you know procedures or something that could be done differently that might change something like so rather than say i'm not saying that the the staff is bad at their jobs i don't believe that and i don't believe um and i cuz uh, you know the I referenced the Blaine Potvin article last week, which says, you know, they got people, they got people in the field saying they don't think they're doing that. They're not doing the job right. They, th they think they are. And I, I agree. So it's like you say, okay, is there still anything that could change? Like if somebody's good at their job, are they still possibly needing to change what they're doing? That's a possible discussion. But the idea that it's like, oh, well, the medical staff is, you know, incompetent or, you know, just needs to be fired or something like that, that I don't I don't agree with. So these are just a lot of injuries happening and it's terrible. It's bad luck. It's just it's a it's a hockey game and people get injured in hockey games because it's a violent sport. And it's ridiculous how many injuries have happened at the Canadians, but it's still, I mean, they play a violent sport. So conceivably, everybody on the team could get injured, except apparently Mike Hoffman. So, I mean, it's just, it's just, it, it's just very frustrating, but the, these, it's, it's just the, I, I understand the frustration that people like Dave have with these kind of medical um, criticisms. So that's what I have for this week. That's all. <laughs>